I, I say I say this all the time it sounds ridiculous but it was like slowly dawning on me that I would actually have to become a doctor at the end of it it wasn't just about here's another test here's another exam where you can prove that you're smart enough it's not it's not just that it's actually a vocation and it's, it's a vocation. so let's get real our value as doctors has significantly diminished over the last decade so how can we turn that around by upskilling and creating rewarding and impactful careers on our own terms? Welcome to Disrupting Doctors' Careers. I'm your host, Dr. Baina Bubbers jones and I'm on a mission to connect one million talented doctors with the best in diverse career opportunities. So welcome to today's episode of Disrupting Doctors' Careers. And I really, I really love it when we have guests on our podcast who have successfully married medicine with creativity. You know, the the sky's the limit, right? And so I'm really, really, really proud to introduce to you. You may have met her already because she is her own podcast host and she's got this really strong, incredible personal brand. Um, it's Rolake Ojo who is a healthcare graphic designer and brand strategist. Uh, She's also a podcast host for Brand New Doctor, and she is going to really share her own journey, how she moved and transitioned over from being a doctor to the designer that she is today and really making a huge impact in not only the the business world, but also the medical world in sharing her knowledge, her expertise, her network, and inspiring so many people and doctors across the world. So it's a real pleasure to have you on this podcast. Thank Thank you you for joining. It's such a pleasure, honestly. Thank you. No worries. So, I mean, I know that, you know, from our recent conversation that Mm -hmm. you you actually had been to a Medic Footprints event, event in the past. Yes. <laughs> and so your journey with us started some time ago, like a lot of doctors we see actually on this podcast. And so it's always a real pleasure to see how you have designed your own career to make it fit your own passions and goals. So I'd love to hear from you. And I always like to start from the the, the beginning, the entry point into medicine. Mm. Why did you choose medicine as a career to start with? Yes. So why I went into medicine, I think this will resonate with a lot of people. You know what I find interesting, actually, when we talk about our career kind of pathway and everything, I think for a lot of doctors, it starts in a really similar way that perhaps they knew people or their mom or dad was a doctor. And surprise, surprise, that's like the same thing for me as well. <laughs> so I I grew up in a pretty medical family and medicine was kind of always the thing. And I think um, particularly for me, I had a really strong desire to kind of prove myself and prove that I was intelligent because I had early experiences for me in school um, when we first came to the UK years ago in the 90s. And that really made me feel kind of less than. And so medicine kind of presented a perfect way for me to prove the opposite and prove that I was capable. So that was kind of why I went into um, medicine. I think um, it became pretty clear to me when I got to medical school, um, I, I I remember even getting my A level results, and knowing that I'd 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 kind of reached the requirement for the like the conditional offer that they give you, and being really underwhelmed, I suppose is the word. Or it felt really anti. It felt really anticlimactic. Wow! So getting the results and being like, you got into medical school, and you're yeah. like. Ah. Uh, yeah, uh. I, I think, you you know, you, you build up towards going, you know, for something or you focus on a goal so much that you maybe forget why you're doing it. Yeah, when you get to that goal, you're like, wait, wait, what was this yeah, for again? Wh- why, why do I want to do this? Yeah, um, absolutely. And, yeah, and, and medical school for me was, I know, and I, I say I say this all the time, it sounds ridiculous, but it was like slowly dawning on me that I would actually have to become a doctor at the end of it. It wasn't just about here's another test, here's another exam where you can prove that you're smart enough. It's not, it's not just that, it's actually a vocation and it's a really, mm. it's a really important decision to make. And I just don't think me at 16 years old <laughs> was, not, was not focused or doing it for the right reasons at that time. No, I mean, that echoes, I think a lot of people, including myself, 
I mean, for me, it was very much you're going to be a medicine, med- a doctor of medicine yeah. or a lawyer. Yeah. You're clever. Do one of the two and you'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. Um, but th- that's interesting that, you know, even from getting your A level results, you were yeah. totally sold, but you <laughs> went down that pathway. And at what point did you say, actually, I'm going to step outside of this because there's more, there's more for me? Yes, I, uh, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure what the specific moment was. I think, I think, as I say, it was kind of slowly dawning on me as I was going through medical school. Um, the more clinical things were becoming, I was like, wow, I'm not, I don't just get to sit in lectures all day and mm. learn this stuff. It's interesting, but like when it comes to the application, I don't know if this is, this is how I want to use this knowledge that I have right now um I I do remember in medical school having a pretty distinct thought because I used to I used to doodle all of the time when I was in lectures I would sit and it would help me to, it would help me to stay awake we were talking about how it was basically a nine-to-five job <laughs> being in being in you know being in medical school yep um, full-time yeah full-time it's full studying t- yeah it's full-time studying and then you go yeah. home and you study some more yeah and um and yeah I, I it, to keep me awake in lectures I would doodle all of the time and there was a point I think I was probably in my third or my fourth year I remember thinking I think creativity is gonna save me from doing this forever <laughs> that's that's yeah. the, the thought that I had then but I were obviously you, I was gonna going. say like were you creative before you went into medicine yeah like, absolutely what were you yeah. doing I was drawing a lot um I was I was into textiles I mean I yeah I remember I like used to like designing things that to make like bags and things like that I would create things um I loved drawing I loved using oil pastels um watercolors uh I was very much into just pattern design in in general I think in particular um you know I loved um I I I think when I was like maybe I was 11 or something I saw henna I saw Mendy designs for the first time ever and I thought it was incredible and I used to love drawing those kinds of things um so yeah just it's it was always a part of my my life and with my sisters as well we always loved singing and dancing mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff and I always thought that was kind of normal for everyone to do at home to just mm-hmm, always mm-hmm. be <laughs> making or doing or singing or something like that and I realized like maybe not not for everybody but you know different people have different ways of expressing their creativity I suppose it's interesting because I've got two small children right and I see their creativity like Mm. innate creativity the ability to fantasize or reenact or even just create something from nothing yeah you know artwork all of those things that as as parents like they always encourage and then like what's valued in the world of work tends to be quite different oh absolutely in that sense so you know, I see a, I see a lot of people, especially medics, who have this kind of hidden background mm. of creativity that unfortunately does get stripped away from them because there's not much place for it in traditional healthcare, right? Outside yeah. of entrepreneurship innovation, which is another story in itself. There's not enough emphasis on that in healthcare yeah. in a traditional clinical role, but that's another thing. But so it's really incredible that you had this skill set and even I say despite, but, you know, even whilst you were going down the medical pathway, it was still calling to you saying, hey, do something with me. So I guess (laughs) my question is like, what actually, at what point did you say, right, I'm going to see whether I can make something work from my passion? Yeah, it took, it did take me a really long time. You know, I, I did stay, I stayed, I finished medical school. I, I did my F1, my F2, I did an F3 even and um it it took me that time to kind of build the courage because I think a big part of um being enmeshed in medicine is just being kind of around similar um thoughts it's because it becomes a bit of an echo chamber and it's hard for you to it's hard for you to move outside of that when everybody else is going in the same kind of direction um I think that's just normal with with human nature and and also just the i you know a lot of um the rhetoric out there is oh you know you've already come this far in medical school you should finish you should finish medical school i did want to finish i did want to have a degree and i that was i would say that was completely my choice but um but then it's like okay now you finished you need to 
you have to stay here and you have to do foundation years or else you'll never be able to practice medicine again if you if you decide you want to come back again so I think I was very fear driven from that point onwards wow. and there was a point um I remember in foundation in my my f3 year I actually um I applied for GP because I guess it was the only kind of lifestyle not even specialty but just the lifestyle around it that I could possibly see myself in and um and even doing that I remember you know I'd finish F1 and F2 it's like okay the the theory is that you're free now but then people would be like oh but you really should finish something yes right that finish something <laughs> rhetoric yeah that, I, like, something. I, hear, I, I hear that from my mum all that you know thinking back to the past when I was jumping from surgery to urology to mm. occupational medicine when are you going to finish something <laughs> everyone's finishing things but you're not yeah. finishing you're not a finisher as if careers are things that you can finish, finish. anyway exactly <laughs> exactly I just wanted to bring you back actually um to the point where I went to obviously no no no, no. when mm. when you're you mentioned the importance of being around especially when you you've got the you're fear driven to stay where you are because it's comfortable because it's mm. the thing that you know it's because of the thing that everyone else around you knows so they're saying don't do it yeah right and and I, I'm bringing that up in particular because this is one of the biggest challenges mm -hmm. that doctors face beyond their own internal mindset and their own internal narratives people around you are saying hey don't do it because you might yeah. as well just finish this and then you'll be fine because a lot of those people haven't had what you're looking for yeah you know that they, they aren't they aren't in branding they haven't worked outside of the the healthcare system and they've been driven by the same fear that you've been driven by mm -hmm. and so the mentors around you are saying the net sharing the narrative that you should stick to what you're doing now and so I, I go back to you on like how did you break free mm -hmm. from those narratives that would have otherwise kept you in that healthcare system yeah I think I have to I really have to cast my mind back to what helped me to to make the leap to be honest with you there was a bit of a leap but I would say it happened in kind of small and in incremental steps Mm -hmm. And I th and I think it, I think it is important to highlight that, you know, I didn't I didn't just wake up one day and say screw this I'm gonna go and like I'm gonna go to design school and become a designer instead. It took me years to to actually take that step. Uh, I had to kind of slowly dip my 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 feet into the water. And I think maybe a braver person than me would make that kind of decision. But I understand that we're really risk averse people. It, a lot of the time who go into to medicine we've, we've been brought up on a rhetoric of stability particularly if you come from an immigrant family like I do uh -huh. stability is important stability is everything and so it's not easy to make that decision that you're gonna one day quit and do something else so my first choice the first thing that I decided to do um was I guess F3 was a, like a small rebellion in and of itself instead of going straight into another kind of training um program going straight into GP I I took that year I still worked pretty much nine to five <laughs> not more than that because I was afraid but then I decided to um I applied to do a language assistant how do you describe this basically it's a kind of an exchange program that the British Council does with France and so I took six months out to be a language assistant in France and so I said to myself, okay, during the six month period of time, I'm going to, I'll apply for a GP post and I'll take six months out to decide on whether I want to take it and also explore my other options, enjoy France, enjoy kind of having just a bit more time to myself, practice my French. And then at the end of it, I'll make a choice. So I think that was, that was kind of my kind of safe way of taking a risk if you like um so that was the first thing that I did and I would yeah I just I just wanted to jump jump in yeah. on that one because yeah, sure. I think it's, it's this is highlighted how important everyone's got their different risk profile right mm -hmm. and their tastes and so you just described that you had a process you went through a certain process it may not yeah. all have been completely planned but you gave yourself that space and that time 
that was comfortable for you that didn't put yourself too much into your freak zone yeah. that led you to a decision that you felt was right for you at the time because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people think oh I've got to make the right decision yeah and it's not necessarily about the right decision like you can only make the best decision you can make at that time mm -hmm. you can also change and will absolutely change as you as yeah. you grow in life mm -hmm. right and I think a lot of doctors get held back by that oh if I leave traditional clinical medicine that's it and if it goes wrong I'll be on the streets and destitute and the reason why they fear that is because actually that story is still told yeah even when I was literally like 18 years ago I was told that and like <laughs> it, it, I've never met one out of the thousands tens of hundreds of thousands or not millions of doctors that have mm. been through medic footprints not one has said I ended up unemployed as a result of leaving my job but mm -hmm. I know doctors now that have been made unemployed from their clinical jobs. GP, hello. So, I mean, just going back to, to you and your process, mm. um, again, like the, the rhetoric of stability was another thing that really, um, yeah, it just, it just really put a light bulb over my head mm. was because, yeah, a lot of, a lot of doctors are worried that moving and changing careers will mean that loss of stability yeah so I'd, I'd love to hear from you in your process yeah and taking that a bit of a sabbatical um did the definition of stability change for you that then led you to then make choices as to whether to retrain in a different area etc cetera, etc cetera. and yeah the, the living of is this really going to be the end of my mm. life because I'm leaving medicine and yeah I'd, lo I'd love to hear that if you remember it that I think that's a really good question because the truth is I think I think I don't think that my definition of stability changed mm -hmm. I think that rather where I where I w what I thought could contribute to stability or or my locus of control over stability changed so in the past I thought medicine would give me stability but mm -hmm. I slowly developed confidence within myself to create stability for myself and believe that I could you know I could fend for myself I could look after myself no matter what situation I was thrown into that doesn't come immediately and you have to like I said you know you have you I I did this incrementally I went from thinking my steady paycheck was the 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 only way for me to have stability to now working and you know contracting and and finding my own clients and believing that I can I can create stability myself over a really long period of time um but you have to kind of dip your I think you have to be able to kind of dip your feet into it first of all and like I said my my version of my version of kind of exploring outside of the bounds of what I thought traditional stability was was still finding you know a stable a stable kind of um job if you like for six months but I guess the point was that this was in a completely different environment um the the rules around it had completely changed I was being paid a different amount of money I still had to I had to think and plan in different kinds of ways so it kind of slowly nudged me in that direction in the direction that I'm in now where I had to um, I had to kind of think on my feet a little bit more about how I could look after myself outside of the paycheck that I was used to having already. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And you also proved to yourself that it, it's doable. Yeah, exactly. That's the, that's the point is that you, you more than anything, this, I feel like your, your personal journey in your career is, it's like a, it's like a process of you proving to yourself that you are capable of anything that you set your mind to yeah no no absolutely and I think a lot of doctors are but it, it's really the mindset it's the fear it's all those mm. narratives that are holding a lot of doctors back and I, I I would echo everything it's like whatever you're held back by just create a program for yourself or a process for yourself yeah that gives you that safety net that you feel like you, you need Mm. to actually go and do it because it's risk mitigation sorry risk mitigation at the end yeah. of the day 
Um, and you could literally sit down and write it down saying, if this happens, then I'll do this. Or yes. if this happens, then I'll do this. And I'm going to give myself this specific time frame. And I've got these backup plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, whatever it is. Mm. Um, and I do see a lot of doctors that that do that and hardly ever do come back from it. I know like literally a handful of doctors over the years who have come back into clinical medicine, but with joy, mm. not with, oh, it, it failed. <laughs> narrative well, that's what they tell me anyway like it, it's because actually they miss clinical medicine and they really enjoyed it and they want to go back and they enjoy it more as a result and they've benefited from the learnings that they've taken from you know the the other sectors they've worked in which is beneficial to healthcare in itself mm-hmm. um so it's it's basically win-win experience for a lot of people um but I just wanted to jump forward into yeah like so 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 you studied right yeah. um and and then how did you end up working for yourself because that itself is mm-hmm. skill yeah so. and not exactly the easiest thing in the world to get started but I would love to I'd love to hear like how did you get on with that process yeah and and rebranding yourself in that process mm, yeah this so this is yeah this is this is a work in in progress let's say this is um I, I I always start by saying that I'm not the finished product at all um and I think you kind of have to rejoice in that to be honest with you because I think it's not a great thing if you ever believe that you are the finished product <laughs> and so um so you know where I started from in medicine um I like I said I went to France for a time um I came back I worked as a project manager um, just to give you a rundown of other things that I've done until I got to this point. Uh, I worked as a project manager for a time at a tech company because I wanted to, I figured that was the next decision that it seemed like the best choice at that time for me. Um, and then moving from there, I decided to work with my sister who owned a dental practice. So I was managing the business side of the the dental practice during that time. And it was, that was really where I was able to kind of put together what I'd been learning about myself through the process of trying different things because I guess before I tell you about what I'm doing now I think it's important to highlight that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't figured out if I hadn't gone through all of these steps and I hadn't Mm -hmm. been paying attention to what I was learning about myself and what I was learning about the world and putting that together to figure out what my purpose was essentially Mm -hmm. and um, you know at each one of these stages I was kind of as I say, building confidence in myself um, and just building up a picture of what mattered to me most. And it really became clear to me working with my sister that being creative in my work was really important. Also, autonomy in my work was really, really important. Obviously, she's my sister and she trusted me. and, um, And technically, I guess she was my boss, but she gave me a lot of autonomy with the role and trusted me to to be able to carry that out and I flourished in that um so putting those two things together and realizing that whenever I wanted to solve a problem I would try to do that as creatively as I could and seeing the effect it had on patients on their experience and how we were able to differentiate ourselves from other dental practices up and down the road because they weren't thinking in the same kind of way it really Kind of, I, I had a kind of light bulb moment when I realized that design is so, so important. This is always something that I cared about, creativity and design, but I saw the proof in the pudding, was in the pudding that it was actually a really important thing for patients' experiences and also for how well the business was doing as well. So that's when I decided that I wanted to go to design school. And um, so I, I went to design school. It's probably one of the most difficult things that I've done. <laughs> and... I I guess for me, as I said, because I'd done that kind of work of thinking about my values and what was important to me, I'd been paying attention. I I knew that autonomy was the most kind of important thing for me. Um, it's not to say that I would never consider having a job or working for somebody else again, but uh, I suppose there's a difference when you are carving a path as opposed to like following a path essentially Uh uh when you decide that you're doing a job you're even if you are doing a job you are working in the NHS whatever it's it's to fulfill your own purposes rather than to 
fulfill somebody else's essentially yeah um, and yeah. there's a lot more depth to that isn't there there's a lot more meaning in that there's a lot mm-hmm. more and 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 I mean I'm sure a lot of people would really yeah re- whatever what you just said really resonates with a lot of people because autonomy is one of the things that a lot of doctors feel it is lost yeah from healthcare or lost lost from their practice in healthcare so a lot more doctors who are leaning more towards preventative medicine, which as someone pointed out to me the other day, medicine is more about tackling diseases rather than preventing them. Absolutely. So actually, are we all in the right profession? But is that the autonomy to say, this is how I feel that medicine should be practiced. Uh, this is how I feel the system should run. Like all of those points that we don't really have much control over in a, tra- a traditional clinical role. So... Yeah, no, I, I see because I identify with that because as as I've grown over the years, I recognize how important this autonomy mm-hmm. is for me and not having to answer to anyone but myself whilst also taking 100, 100% responsibility for that. Yeah. And again, like going back into to traditional healthcare settings, you have a lot of the responsibility, but not enough autonomy to match it. And, yes. and that that is that can be really really challenging yeah um so just being mindful of the time I'd, I'd love to hear I mean now that you've got this you know career that you've developed for yourself and mm-hmm. you've developed your own brand you've got this you've got autonomy in what you'll do you're working with some really impactful and, and you're still working in healthcare in that sense that you'll yeah. be designed to healthcare which is such an important niche what would you advise for doctors who do have that creative, not I wasn't going to say streak, but who are creatives mm. and really want to explore how they can best marry medicine and or healthcare plus creativity? What tips or advice would you give to help them really start on that career path? Yeah, that is that's a very good question. And I think this is something that I'm still exploring myself um, through the podcast. It's something that I like to talk about a lot on Brand New Doctor as well. I like to kind of probe people's ideas on creativity because I suppose in a sense, I'm the podcast is kind of a bit of therapy for me, if you like, um, where I can kind of reckon with things that were perhaps difficult or troubling to me when I was a doctor and being a creative or feeling like I was a creative trapped in a doctor's body, if you like, uh-huh, was uh-huh. was definitely um, was definitely something that I struggled with. The solution that I found was leaving, <laughs> but I don't think that works. I don't I don't, I don't want to prescribe that for everybody. I think um, and I, I, I really try not to be too prescriptive with things because I think we get enough of that in in medicine. But in terms of like advice for exploring your own creativity I think it's important to first of all look at your creativity like a practice I would say um I think that it's really I think it's really important to realize that creativity isn't just about inspiration just striking you because if you leave it and I mean, it does do that oftentimes. I think that's how a lot of people have experienced creativity. But the trouble is when you are working a really busy job that is really, really demanding and your head is always in that space of kind of fighting fires, you're feeling really below the line all of the time. It is really, really hard for you to feel creative in that space. And so you might even start to doubt yourself as a creative you go into it thinking I'm creative I like doing these things and then you know you look at yourself and it's like I haven't picked up a paintbrush in two years am I actually creative I haven't had a creative thought or or um I haven't you know inspiration hasn't struck me in this period of time and I think that can be um really destabilizing for your identity and so that's why I say it's important to look at your creativity as a practice where you carve out the time for it and you are consistent with it as well Um, because you you'll find that actually creativity doesn't just have to be something that strikes you when you feel like it it can be something that you can nurture and that you can build um, towards yourself you don't have to depend on the muses or the gods or whatever it is that you think feeds you that that idea it is something that you can build up in yourself so I would recommend that for 
people who consider themselves creative. I would recommend it for people who don't think of themselves as creative in the traditional sense. If there is something that you, uh, a kind of a hobby or some kind of outlet for you that is um, that is hard for you to do because of, it's hard for you to find the motivation to do with your difficult job or your your busy time schedule and everything treat it as a practice rather than the thing that you do when you feel like it because then it will really quickly fall to the wayside and then you you wouldn't even believe that it's something that is a part of who you are anymore absolutely it's it as you said it's about carving out that time no matter how small it is it's small amounts of time consistently yeah and as you said treating it as a practice and and uh, like continually nurturing it like a child yeah <laughs> really. like, it, like, like child. you have to give it that mm-hmm. time um but you know similar to you I I wasn't able really to truly reconnect with my creativity until I actually stepped out of yeah you know, the wrong environment and put myself in the right environment mm. but even then you know there's still that actually am I, am I really in touch with my deepest creativity mm. especially running a business where you're kind of more um dealing with the admin and the numbers and the, the non-creative <laughs> parts of it yeah of than the creative parts of it um but yeah and, and it's interesting because you know marrying music and creativity is such an important skill set for anyone to have and for those people that do have a creative background like this is your time mm. because you've heard about the creator economy right it's called that for a reason because there's money to be made (laughs) um if you are a creator especially being a medic especially being a medic in writing in content in media and seo there's there's so much you can do one of our fellows gp Mm -hmm. um he was looking to get into pharma very quickly he realized that you know he, he, he did his his love was not in pharma a lot of doctors think oh do pharma consulting or health tech one of those three things because yeah. that's what everyone seems to do but realistically you know a lot of people are just saying and doing what what, what is the thing to do right what what the herd seems to to do but the reality is there are so many other things out there anyway we managed to uncover like what are you beyond being a gp mm-hmm. how can we help you stand out to who you are who were you before you even came into medicine and he said oh i love music and the next thing I know, this guy is on LinkedIn on a fairly daily basis, created this whole niche of music health tech that I never knew existed, opened up all these doors in the UK and overseas. And basically, he's he's carved out and created this niche for himself as a music health tech advisor and opened up so Amazing. many opportunities and doors doing it like that because he's got the very specific niche mm-hmm. that just didn't hasn't really existed yeah so whenever people come across him especially being music and or health related because there is actually a huge industry that's that need his services then he's like one of the very few if not only and they're like well we can't go to anyone else can we you know (laughs) so it's it's and also like like, this is from our doctors and industry fellowship it's like you have to go through a process that you just described you have to go through a process of your own to get to where you are today and even that is part of a process to get to where you're going to be the next few years and the next few years exactly right and making the mistakes reflecting doing it doing the doing because a lot of people will say I'm going to think about it and then you end up Mm -hmm. thinking about it forever and you just never will know because you haven't done anything Mm. like actually doing something it may not be the right thing but it's something that that starts you on that path Mm-hmm. Um, and that will get you to where you want to go as long as you have some clarity on where you're going when I say clarity you don't need to know the finished article of what it is but you've got to have at least a sense of what you're looking to leave behind and what you're looking to embrace yeah and that I is a, that I feel is enough because a lot of people are like I don't know career, what career I want to do that doesn't really matter yeah I I, I mean I, I always say that it's it's important for you to have direction but it's mm-hmm. not as important for you to know the destination. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important to make the distinction between those two things because in medicine or medicine will teach you that you need to know where you're going before you, you set off. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that, that way of thinking maybe applies to, you know, real life journeys. But when we're talking about our career journeys, journeys that go on for much longer in our lives, 
you can't possibly predict the future and you have to really break free of that that way of thinking it's not easy but um but really just staying present with the decision that's in front of you yeah. is the most important thing and just taking the next step that's necessary is all you really have to do 100% well okay thank you so much for your time today yeah. your insights your wisdom your knowledge your journey and everything that you're doing in this space it's it's incredible and uh if if you are going to be looking up well okay definitely go and listen to her podcast brand new doctor how else can people get hold of you yes you can get hold of me through my website which is rollercoachjo.com also you can see more of my design work my branding work at anmatter.com and yeah i'm also on linkedin so i'm 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 wherever you want. <laughs> you can you can come find me. Brilliant. And and to be fair, you are not the first designer on this podcast. Mm. We also had a designer actually went near to when we started it who was in interior design. Oh, wow. Um so it's it's great to see more and more doctors who are getting into design work. Even before that, I knew I knew a doctor who got into car design. You know, wow. it's, it's incredible what's out there. It doesn't yeah. have to be health tech consulting or pharma, guys. There's no, it's true. <laughs> I think to your point about that, actually, the last thing I'll say is that we have to remember that we all got into medicine because we were told that smart people do medicine mm -hmm. and or they do law, they do engineering, whatever it is. But, you know, beyond that choice and you've gotten to that, you've gotten to this point because of that lie that was told to you that that that's the route you should take. You have to then use that same logic and be like well it doesn't make sense that just because I'm smart and I'm a doctor I should go into one of these three fields <laughs> you could end yeah. up in exactly the same position so exactly. you really have to be true to yourself and, and figure out what's right for you be true to yourself but I should like to, to challenge you on that because I mean you say it's a lie but realistically it's what people were told at that time isn't yeah, it it's like I think, if you want a stable career yeah do one of these professions, law, medicine, accountancy, and you'll be set for life. I think right? I think the lie is that it's right for everybody who is who's got the grades for it. Yeah. And yeah, it's not right it's, for everyone. Yeah. But I don't think it's an intentional. As in no, it's like it's, at the end of the day, like our parents, people around us, they're doing what they think is best. Mm -hmm. Just like the people who if if you're in healthcare and you're looking to leave, they're telling you what they genuinely think is best because that's all they know. Yeah. And I think there's a difference that like, you know, everyone, everyone generally, especially if you're asking them for advice, they do want the best mm -hmm. of you. Most people, not everyone, but most people. But if their knowledge is limited on what you're asking them, you need to go and find people who are doing what you want. To you need do. to surround yourself with around, yes. different kinds of people. Maybe the word isn't lie, but it's a story at least. It's and you have to find you have to find other stories that I always say we need, you. you need to brainwash yourself. You're already brainwashed. Mm -hmm into a certain way of thinking that suits your current career situation so you need to then go and reprogram and brain your force yourself again mm -hmm. to then pursue the career or the lifestyle to achieve that lifestyle that you want and as well okay has described it is about surround consistently and continually surrounding yourself with the people that are doing it not just saying it they're doing it and they're living it so you end up speaking like them talking like them having the friends they have having the connections they have it's called networking <laughs> it's called community and I know it's like, oh, not networking again. but yeah it this is why this is such an important part of your journey Absolutely. and again if you're someone who recognizes and values that is an important part of your journey don't forget the doctors and industry fellowship which is we're actually uh, enrolling for the new cohort in a few months. If you're on our mailing list, you'll find it out very soon. Medicfootprints.org forward slash join our mission. And we are only after people who are serious about making change. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't need to know your destination. It is about actually, I want to make a change for my life, for my future. And that is the biggest indication that we know that you're ready to go on the journey with our, our growing community who are doing exactly the same thing. Amazing. But anyway, thank you so much for okay. Thank you.